I understand you're a terrific group and that you've uh, had a lot of questions for both Warren and uh, the speakers. Uh, don't hesitate to raise a hand and interrupt me. And also, if I get too loud, because I generally am loud and I'm also being amplified, uh, wave your hands wildly, or if I talk too fast, let me know. Um, I wanted to, I have, thanks. Um, I wanted to start out by um, just mentioning something that ought to be of particular interest to you guys here in this room. Uh, in 2002, a survey was taken of college-bound high school students, and only 25% of them could identify the body of water between the United States and China. Only 25%, I'm sorry? Uh, only 25% of them. And that's why um, I generally start off when I talk about this subject uh, emphasizing that when you speak about U.S.-Taiwan-China relations, um, you have to take note of the fact that it is and remains, despite what I will be talking about, the single most dangerous place in the world. And why do I say that? It's because it's the only place in the world where two nuclear-armed great powers could go to war. Now, you might be saying, but there's not likely to be a war, and I will give you a little information about why I think that we have to take that seriously. But let's say there were, you might say the United States would certainly be wise enough to stay out uh, of such a war. But it depends very much on how things develop, and you can't forget that we would have a tiny little democracy being attacked by one of the remaining communist countries, Red China, attacking this poor little country, perhaps unprovoked, out of the blue, and it would be very hard for the United States to stay out. How would the White House explain to Congress uh, that it was not going to do anything to rescue this uh, democracy. You only have to go back to 1996 uh, when China started firing missiles in the general vicinity of Taiwan and Bill Clinton sent two aircraft carrier battle groups to the waters around Taiwan to make sure the situation did not get out of hand. Okay, today things are much better. Um, the challenge is less, the danger is less, because relations around the whole triangle of the U.S., Taiwan, and China uh, are much improved. Um, but the point that I'm going to make here today is that war could still come through misunderstanding, miscalculation, accident, as well as intent. Wars happen. Wars happen for strange reasons. And therefore, all of us in this room, in the government, in and international organizations, and in your classrooms need to know more about this situation. Ignorance is dangerous, and it adds to the precariousness of this situation. Now, I published uh, a book, um, actually there's been two. This is, suggests what I'm saying, that it's a dangerous place. Um, this most recent one, Straight Talk, uh, came out uh, this spring and is designed specifically to address that lack of knowledge uh, and talk about what it means for US peace and security. It explores the depth and breadth of relations and of mistrust uh, that characterize those relations. And I'm not talking about the obvious tension between the United States and the People's Republic of China. That's where you would expect it. And that is certainly an important variable. Uh, rather, it is the distrust uh, that has colored relations between allies and friends in the United States and Taipei. Uh, a mistrust that it remains largely unacknowledged because it is so awkward and embarrassing. You're not supposed to distrust your friends. A quick way to understand this is to look at events in Taiwan in 1957. 
Until then, Americans believed, and I can't even see my notes, so I'm going to have to put vanity aside and put on the glasses. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Americans believed that with an alliance in place, the U.S. 7th Fleet um, patrolling the Taiwan Strait and China at bay, that they enjoyed stable, friendly, and cooperative relations with Taiwan. The American ambassador was in Hong Kong addressing his diplomatic colleagues and praising those relations. But just as he uttered the words, a message arrived Crowds had pillaged the American embassy in Taipei, hurling a massive safe out the window, which happened to land on the ambassador's car. Americans had been injured, and classified papers littered the streets. The riot and US surprise demonstrate, I think, the depth of mistrust and misunderstanding between Taipei and Washington, even at the very peak of their relationship in the 1950s. Superficially, this disorder erupted when a US court-martial acquitted an American for killing a Chinese who had allegedly been peering through a bathroom window at the killer's naked wife. Serious questions arose during the trial about the plausibility of the evidence and the propriety of the defense. Nevertheless, when the verdict came out, Americans in the courtroom boisterously celebrated and evoked amongst the Chinese present bitter, bitter memories of something called extraterritoriality, which was the system under which foreigners in China lived exempt from local law. And it also, not surprisingly, magnified resentment against American racism. Now, although American officials recognized that the public was genuinely outraged, nevertheless, Washington concluded that Chiang Kai-shek had manipulated their anger to convey displeasure with American policies. Taiwan and the United States disagreed about attacking China, about the possibility that the nationalist Chinese could return to the mainland, uh, and withdrawing from the offshore islands, which were these worthless little bits of uh, land too close to the China coast that Chiang Kai-shek insisted on holding on to, and Dwight Eisenhower tried to make them leave, but they wouldn't. They're still there. Uh, Taipei feared Washington would not protect its interests and that it would sell them out to the People's Republic, even as the United States worried that it could not count on Taiwan to share its security priorities in the Cold War, instead dragging it into a war with China. On both sides, differences in priorities and perspectives through generations of leaders and their advisors have raised questions about the wisdom and durability of the alliance, I shouldn't say alliance anymore, alignment. Uh, and situations like this, this is the first Taiwan Straits crisis, 1954-55. This is a poster from the mainland uh, talking about liberating Taiwan. Uh, the next crisis was in 1958, same thing. Uh, and there will be subsequent ones that I won't talk about in 1962, and then I mentioned 1995-96. So we've had really four uh, offshore islands uh, crises, uh, and those all um, when Americans realized that there was nothing in it for them. Demands to disengage uh, from the relationship with Taiwan have arisen repeatedly in the United States because Taiwan, after all, is distant, unknown, and clearly dangerous. During and after World War II, there was dismay over the ineffectiveness and corruption of the nationalist Chinese government, which soured the White House and the State Department on the relationship with Taiwan. But the island emerged as a strategic outpost in the Cold War. And Chiang Kai-shek, however authoritarian, a symbol of freedom in contrast to Mao Zedong and his communist tyranny. Taiwan soon became a base for intelligence, gathering, and sabotage operations against China. And in time, Taiwan experienced an economic boom 
becoming a significant American trade partner, which of course it is today. Taiwan closes shop and none of your computers are going to work anymore. Uh, the enormous disparities in power, culture, size, and development, however, have rendered cooperation between the U.S. and Taiwan difficult, as did U.S. global responsibilities. If you're sitting in Taiwan, you're clearly the most important actor in the world. But from the U.S. point of view, you're not. And that has always been, I mean, after all, the Chinese think they're the most important, and the U.S. doesn't even think China is that important. Furthermore, Americans who pay attention to foreign policy, and few Americans do, tend to be oriented towards Europe and have devoted appreciably less attention to problems in Asia. Few knew much or know much today about China, and fewer still about Taiwan, even at times of crisis. In Taiwan, at the same time, a majority was preoccupied with creating a viable society and economy, and never more than 20 percent, never more than 20 percent, were committed to the idea of recovering the mainland. Meanwhile, although the United States saw itself as Taiwan's savior, its liberator from the Japanese in World War II, and provider of generous aid, as well as an advocate of democratic values, many in Taiwan saw it as a conspirator in and facilitator of the Guomindang, the Chinese Nationalist Party's repression on the island of Taiwan, uh, especially in the 1940s. U.S. officials practiced willful ignorance in order to accommodate their Cold War goals, supporting Chiang Kai-shek's government as it eliminated a generation of potential political leaders. And that was called the White Terror, where assassination squads went out and, and killed potential Taiwanese leaders of an in, uh, independence movement uh, against Chiang Kai-shek. Distrust of and resentment against the U.S., therefore, did not merely color the views of officials. It also endured among a great many ordinary people in Taiwan. Obviously, if you had friends or family killed, uh, you didn't like the Americans much. In neither group, whether officials or ordinary public, was there much sympathy for Washington's insistence that Taiwan join the Cold War struggle against Moscow. So with such different priorities, leaders often appeared inattentive, irresponsible, and untrustworthy to each other. When in 1969, Richard Nixon abandoned the Cold War assumptions uh, about the PRC, the People's Republic of China, and jettisoned the idea of a free China as a bastion of American values in order to begin normalization with Beijing, you can well imagine that he triggered a whole new level of distrust in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. For Taiwan, uh, excuse me, for China, I'm sorry, for Washington, the China initiative uh, meant strategic advantage over the Soviets. But the new order had costs that the U.S. did not pay. The smaller and weaker participant absorbed most of the shocks. And this proved to not just because Washington's new uh, priorities stunned Taiwan's leaders, who hadn't seen it coming, uh, who had little room for maneuver, who were slow to plan for an unwelcome future and could not, they could not find a way to obstruct Sino-American reconciliation, but also because Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger were prepared to sell Taiwan out in order to get normalization. Henry Kissinger has written that he barely discussed Taiwan during his July 1971 trip to Beijing. But in reality, Taiwan was the highest priority for China, and Kissinger accommodated by surrendering more than the Chinese expected in the very first conversation that he had with them. He promised that the United States would jettison the Mutual Defense Treaty, that it would remove U.S. troops from Taiwan, 
that it would not demand, as it had throughout the 1950s, that China renounce the use of force against Taiwan. It would not give assistance to Taiwan to attack the mainland. It would support China getting a seat in the United Nations. It promised to keep Japan out of Taiwan. It pledged not to support independence or to China's or one China and one Taiwan in the world community. And it assured the Chinese that the CIA would not run covert operations from Taiwan. Uh, I particularly like this. I'm, as you can tell, into political cartoons. Uh, in truth, when the Americans surrendered all those things, it did not expect the Republic of China on Taiwan to survive normalization with China. And the mistrust that was bred in Taiwan in these conditions of uncertainty, uh, when would normalization pan out, how long would diplomatic relations uh, last, invited China to struggle for influence over its destiny inside the United States. The Republic of China on Taiwan became known as a lobbying juggernaut, second only to the Israelis in its ability to manipulate Washington. Despite its status as a dependent, it made demands and followed policies independent of and sometimes directly contrary to American interests. In 1979, the China lobby had its greatest failure as well as its greatest success. Jimmy Carter pursued diplomatic relations with China in secrecy and with little regard for Taiwan's future. Taipei was able to do nothing to prevent the loss of diplomatic recognition. But almost as critical was the absence of any security provisions in the legislation uh, that the Carter administration proposed to Congress that was designed to continue informal uh, relations between Washington and Taipei. If you have a major trade partner here, you need commercial law, uh, you need ways to get people visas, you need a whole series of implementing things that normally would disappear without diplomatic relations. But security provisions the Carter administration didn't uh, include. If Taiwan's going to disappear, you certainly don't want security um, ties with it, and the Mutual Defense Treaty uh, was gone. Taiwan, in fact, defied Jimmy Carter to prevail on Congress through lobbying, networking, espionage, and bribery to secure something called the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979 uh, with provisions that uh, ensured or came close to ensuring Taiwan's defense, and we can talk more about that if you want to. Uh, thereafter, even election of a purportedly sympathetic American president, Ronald Reagan, changed little. Indeed, Taiwan repeatedly thought that sympathetic American presidents would rescue the ROC, but repeatedly proved wrong. Ronald Reagan provided six written assurances about Taiwan's future, including that it would not set an end date for arms sales to Taiwan, it would not consult China on those sales, it would not be a mediator between China and Taiwan, nor would it pressure uh, the Republic of China on Taiwan to negotiate. But Reagan did not reestablish diplomatic relations with Taiwan, as he said during his campaign he would do. Nor did he supply the advanced aircraft that he had promised Taiwan. And indeed, in August, on August the 17th, 1982, in a communique with the Chinese, he presided over the most significant step towards ending arms sales to Taiwan of any president before or since. 
a, an agreement that, uh, that said that the uh, arms, the weapons to be sold to Taiwan would be limited in quality and quantity and would gradually be reduced uh, over time. The reality was that despite everything that Reagan said about how much he cared about little Taiwan, it was for him, as for so many other Americans, a pawn in the Cold War struggle against the Soviet Union. He never bothered learning about Taiwan's history, its economy, or its culture. And indeed, during his tenure, relations between Washington and Beijing actually improved. I was in the State Department at this time, and we talked a lot about how the relationship had finally matured and blossomed, and we expected it would never be bad again. Of course, we didn't have a crystal ball, and we didn't see Tiananmen. But the point is that the Reagan administration was kind of a golden honeymoon uh, period. That was, of course, after Ronald Reagan decided that the Chinese communists were not real communists, and Taiwan didn't benefit from that. Uh, Bill Clinton also disappointed those who thought uh, that his campaign rhetoric disparaging Chinese leaders as you might remember, at least a couple in this room, uh, as butchers of Beijing uh, would yield advantages to Taiwan. Uh, it did not. What became more important to the U.S.-Taiwan relationship was democratization, which began in the mid-1980s. Taiwan's leader acted began democratization as a result of an internal democracy movement and as a result of America's derecognition of the Republic of China government. Democracy created bonds between the U.S. and Taiwan, especially after the massacre at Tiananmen Square. And of course, this is the very famous picture of the man facing down the tanks. Uh, and the disillusionment uh, in the U.S. with China after this uh, event. Then there was the election uh, to the presidency of Taiwan of Chen Shui-bian, who was leader of the Democratic Progressive Party, the main opposition party. This happened in the year 2000, and it seemed to confirm that democracy was blossoming on the island. And again, it strengthened ties as Americans celebrated the consolidation of democracy, um, so far different from what was happening on the mainland. The problem was, at least the problem in some senses, was that if you allow the public a voice, it becomes a public critical not necessarily only of its own government, but of the United States. It began to develop a Taiwan identity, and it boosted the independence movement, which would in turn exacerbate the distrust between Taiwan and the United States. Why? Because the U.S. could no longer rely on the Taiwan government to enforce agreements over public opposition. In the old days, John kai Jacek just said, do it, and it was done. Now the public had to be consulted, and they didn't always see it the same way. A clear incidence of this was friction over arms sales. Americans, having decided to sell weapons to Taiwan, wanted the government to go ahead and buy them and ha let American arms manufacturers make the money. Uh, but once the public had a say in this, they tended not to want to waste the money on weapons. Not so different from our public. Uh, and so you began to have serious strains over issues like this between Washington and Taipei. Now, Chen Shui-bian uh, turned out to be, where did I leave him? There. Uh, turned out to be significantly more pro-independence uh, then uh, we realized uh, that he was. Oh, I see what I did. I moved some things around. Um, this is about arms sales. Um, anyway, so Chen Shui-bian turned out to be more pro-independence uh, than we had expected him to be. Uh, and after 9-11, George W. Bush 
largely abandoned a very positive policy that favored Taiwan, believing that the United States now, in the wake of the terrorist strike, needed the cooperation of the Chinese in, firing, in fighting terrorists. Suddenly, China was no longer a strategic competitor. And even if Bush did not call it a strategic partner the way Clinton had, that was really the direction in which American policy moved. What he wanted from Taiwan was quiet, no surprises. Chun Shui-bian, however, needed to push bold policies to satisfy his core constituency, the most pro-independence people on the island, and he believed to get himself reelected. Again, democratic politics are very different from dictatorship. So Chun Shui-bian increasingly acted without consultation. He changed the name of the Republic of China to Taiwan on the passports. He began teaching Taiwan history instead of Chinese history in the public schools in Taiwan. And he abolished an organization called the National Unification Council, which suggests that he's not much interested in unification with the mainland. Now, it, at the same time, economic conditions were somewhat different, and Taiwan's investments in China were increasing, trade with China was going up, and you even had the relocation of hundreds of thousands of Taiwan businessmen <coughs> to the mainland in order to conduct business with them. Uh, Eventually, like today, um, there are about a million Taiwanese living in, in and around the city of Shanghai alone uh, on the mainland of China. About 5% of Taiwan's uh, population, uh, perhaps, if you look at uh, the whole country. Uh, this did not, however, make the public more favorable to unification with China. Not that they were pro-independence, because they feared being pro-independence meant war with China, but not pro-unification, as had been traditionally thought to be the case. Now, in 2008, they did shift, and the people of Taiwan elected a Guomindang president, Ma ying -jou. Uh, but this was, again, not a pro-unification vote, but a reaction against the corruption of the Chen Shui-bian government and the sorry state of cross-straits and U.S.-Taiwan relations. What, then, is the situation now? U.S.-Taiwan relations have significantly improved. Ma ying Zhou is not only a nice-looking guy, but he's a Harvard-trained lawyer. He's fluent in English. And his policies have generally been sober and reasoned and cautious. Indeed, at his inauguration, he talked about pledging himself to three no's during his administration. No unification, no independence, and no use of force. He has also tried very hard to keep Washington informed about his policies. So that relationship, much better. Cross-straits relations uh, have been much improved as well. Ma has stopped talking about independence. He's agreed to allow direct airline flights from the mainland to Taiwan and the reverse. He has raised the limits on how much Taiwan businessmen can invest on the mainland and, very recently, has begun to allow the Chinese to invest on the island of Taiwan, used to be thought of as a big security problem. And he has even talked about an eventual peace accord uh, with China. The Chinese have stopped referring to deadlines for unification. They have offered a compromise by which Taiwan, this past spring, was allowed to send representatives to the World Health Assembly 
Uh, and you might be thinking, so what? The World Health Assembly is the single most important agency that deals with things like the swine flu, or you remember the SARS infection of several years ago. But what's even more significant is that this is the first time China has allowed Taiwan to play with a UN-affiliated organization since Taiwan left the United Nations in 1971. The two sides, China and Taiwan, are discussing a broad economic cooperation framework agreement. They'll be meeting in October to try to work the details of that out. And Taiwan has declared something that Ma Ying-jeou likes to call a diplomatic truce, that the People's Republic has agreed informally uh, to observe, at least in practice, uh, the bidding for recognition of, of governments. In other words, um, today, only 23 nations in the world recognize Taiwan diplomatically as a nation state in the world community. All the rest have relations with China. Around the margins of that 23, Taiwan, and then China, and then Taiwan, and then China, tended to pay countries to recognize them. Uh, and it was particularly has been profitable for little islands in the Pacific and countries in Central America, where recognition has gone back and forth uh, several times. They've decided that this money diplomacy uh, has to stop. Uh, Taiwan, China even gave Taiwan a pair of panda bears. Uh, but as you can see from this um, slide, if you put the names of those two panda bears together, the significance is that it spells out unification. And so there was a lot of uh, trouble in Taiwan. I'm sorry? No, no. Um, Tuan Tuan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, there was a lot of discussion in Taiwan, should they even accept the pandas under these circumstances? Should they rename them as soon as they arrived at the airport? Um, that crisis has passed. But you can see that even in the best of times, China's not above sticking in uh, the knife. Uh, US-China relations uh, have been uh, good as well. Uh, there's been especially good cooperation on the six-party talks trying to deal with the North Korea situation. Uh, George Bush went to the Summer Olympics in Beijing when the leaders of other governments uh, refused to go. And as you know, because you're meeting in the same building, uh, we just had completion of the uh, security and economic dialogue uh, talks between China and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Secretary uh, of the Treasury Timothy Geithner. And uh, Obama came to this building. That's why you had trouble with traffic the other day uh, to kick those talks off. Now, so a lot of things are going well. But there are also warning signs uh, about uh, the future. China is no less dedicated today than it has ever been to the idea of only one China existing in the world community. The Chinese call this the one China principle. China has not removed any missiles uh, from the coast threatening Taiwan. And there are about 1,400 uh, of these. There has been um, no progress between China, Taiwan and China on security confidence building measures. China has on the books something it calls the anti-secession law. It was sort of conceived of as a counterpart to the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, it provides legal support if China ever uh, decides to attack Taiwan. The Chinese got very tired of the Americans saying, the American government saying, well, we have to do this or we have to do that because of the Taiwan Relations Act. So now they have to do this or have to do that because of the anti-secession uh, law. Uh, Chinese animosity towards the uh, Democratic Progressive Party has not lessened. 
And at the same time, the Chinese don't fully trust Ma Yingzhou, the Guomindang president. And then, of course, we have the worldwide recession, uh, which has hit Taiwan very hard, depressing its economy, bringing down Ma's popularity, diminishing trade across the strait. Uh, this past January, uh, Taiwan exports to the mainland went down a whopping 58%. And Taiwan's gross uh, domestic product in 2009 is expected to shrink anywhere between 3 and 11 percent. So Taiwan clearly is in economic trouble. Uh, Ma Yingzhou is in, uh, as I said, increasingly unpopular, partly because he anticipated a growing economy, uh, but also because the Democratic Progressive Party has accused him of promoting unification uh, and denounces his uh, China policies uh, whenever it can. Uh, the U.S. is still worried about Taiwan's reluctance to buy weapons, and Taiwan is disturbed about Washington's refusal uh, to date to sell it uh, F-16 advanced fighter uh, aircraft. Taiwan wants to buy 66 of these, and Washington says, well, they're very destabilizing, and besides, you haven't bought the other weapons we said we'd sell you, so why should we think you're going to buy these, and why should we take a hit from China if you're not going to buy these? Overall, the U.S. has been supportive of the improvement in cross-straits relations. But there are those in both China and in uh, Taipei, and indeed even here in Washington, who believe that there is uneasiness in the U.S. government and in the U.S. more generally about improving cross-straits uh, ties. And actually, I would say to you, it's not uneasiness. Uh, what you see here in Washington is much better characterized by the word complacency. The improvement in relations around the triangle has led American diplomats uh, not to pay attention to Taiwan. The newspapers, if you'll notice, don't run articles on Taiwan. I couldn't get an op-ed published on Taiwan. I was told nobody's interested right now. Go, uh, go away and write it on Iran, and we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, and complacency, I, I think, leads to um, the kind of inattention that could give the People's Republic the idea that it can do whatever it wants with and to Taiwan. U.S. apathy could alienate Ma Yingzhou and the people of Taiwan. And if Ma's popularity slides significantly, he may try, like his predecessors, to rally support through nationalism. And if he does that, you can well imagine it would reignite the independence movement. So, as I said at the beginning, this is no time to relax. The U.S. could find itself at war in the Taiwan Strait. That's it. I'd be happy to answer any and all questions, unless I was so good that there are no questions left, which is also possible. Yeah. It, it, took, uh, it, it took China to get 100 a, a years uh, to get Hong Kong back, OK? It, thank you. It, and so, you know, and I know there's a myriad of history in between that time. And I know Taiwan is a different scenario, but it sounds like they could be very patient to them. You know, we have a history of 5,000 years. Heck, 50 years is, is, is let's kind of wait this one out, and maybe they'll get back mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And maybe they won't, but how patient can the Chinese afford to be? The Chinese have been more and less patient over time. Um, as I suggested in my remarks, uh, there have been periods in which they've put deadlines on it. If Taiwan refuses to talk to us about unification, let alone unify with us, that's the cause for attacking them. Today, they're much more sober on the issue uh, because they realize essentially what you've just said, and that is time is on their side. After all, they are 1.3 to 1.4 billion people, 
and we're call, uh, talking about, what, uh, 23, 24 million uh, in Taiwan right now. They have the preponderance of size. Their economy is growing much faster and better. Um, they, they understand today that they simply have to wait. Now, the one caveat in that is that they think the kind of economic uh, agreements and the kind of uh, trade and investment that they've seen that Taiwan wants with China is slowly drawing Taiwan closer to the mainland, Kuomintang rule. But things start going badly in the last couple of years of Ma's second term. And it looks like the pro-independence DPP party might come back into power. Then you're going to see hysteria, because then they're going to fear uh-oh, we've made concessions to Ma, we've been generous with Ma, and now we're going to get a pro-independence president who's going to capitalize on those things to move Taiwan further away. So Chinese patience is very variable. Yes, sir. <laughs> is, is there any animosity on the mainland with the Taiwanese, I assume, businessmen who are living there and presumably owning properties and making money, what have you, and the current state of the economy in main, mainland China and everywhere else? I, I missed the first couple of words. Is there any animosity? Animosity. Yeah, so are, the, are mainland Chinese saying, oh, well, we've got these people here that we don't want who are making money off us, and if only they were mainland Chinese and not Taiwanese, we would mm -hmm. be better off? Yeah. Um, to my knowledge, and um, a friend in the field, uh, Shelley Rieger, anybody who wants to know a lot about Taiwan politics, go read Shelley Rieger's work, uh, has did a study recently about the Taiwan business community on the mainland. And to my knowledge, she did not find that kind of friction. Now, it is true that um, Taiwan people in China are not seen as just other Chinese by the Chinese, even if the government would like them to do that. Uh, they are seen as different. And there is a tendency to be concerned about resources being drained off to Taiwan, but not a lot, because a, most of that's being reinvested in businesses on the mainland. The, I, th I would say the main point of friction really comes, and it's both anti-Taiwan and anti-South Korea, um, for the same reason. And that is factories owned by and managed by Taiwan businessmen or, and South Korean businessmen tend to have the most oppressive managements, sometimes even worse than the Chinese themselves, lowest wages, worst working conditions, the least human rights. And so there is friction there. Um, why aren't the Taiwanese treating us better? And why are they being allowed to come here and do this to us? Uh, but that's, that's really because of the way they're behaving, less than because of who they are. Yes? I, I wonder how much you feel the example of Hong Kong can inform what may occur between Taiwan and China? That, um, the question was about the example of Hong Kong. Um, the Chinese certainly hoped that Hong Kong would be a model for unification with Taiwan. Um, the one country, two systems slogan uh, and model under which that government was organized was designed originally for Taiwan and put to use with Hong Kong in the hopes that the kinks would get worked out and then Taiwan would say, oh, this is wonderful, we want to do it too. But in 1997, there were massive say no to China rallies across the island of Taiwan. Uh, the people regardless of political persuasion, turned out uh, to say, Hong Kong was a British colony. We've never been a colony. Uh, Hong Kong was oppressed. We're not oppressed. Uh, and so they really dismissed that model. The Chinese were very slow to understand that. But you will notice that they don't talk about one country, two systems much anymore. Um, they do talk about a relationship in which both Taiwan and China will be part of some larger Chinese structure. And they think that is a more winning slogan. Um, you know, my own feeling is if China 
said, no, we won't attack, we don't care if Taiwan is independent or not, that Taiwan would go independent tomorrow. That the people really don't want to be part of China, but they're afraid. And they understand, there's no doubt, that China would attack if they declared independence. So what they've done is to get as close to the precipice as you can get, be as independent as you can be, without saying that you are. Now, Chen Shui-bian sometimes got very, sort of put a foot over that line, uh, because he liked to talk about how Taiwan was already independent, so they didn't have to declare independence. Uh, and that was part of the problem uh, that the U.S. had with him. But um, basically, uh, the one country, two systems model from Hong Kong is not a viable model. And besides, it's not working all that well in Hong Kong either. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Does Taiwan have a, a Japanese card that they might play, a Russian card, in order to draw, if the United States uh, support becomes tentative, uh, do they see anybody else in the region that may help them out uh, in their cause to stay independent of, mm -hmm. of China? Um, the Russians uh, were closest to Taiwan uh, in the 1940s, actually, uh, and John Kai-shek did flirt with the Russian authorities in hopes of getting support. That never panned out. Uh, the relationship with Japan is a much more complex one. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, Taiwan was a Japanese colony, and J there are the more conservative elements in Japan's political system have continued to have close ties uh, with Taiwan. Uh, although right at the moment there's a bit of a kerfuffle over something that the unofficial Japanese representative uh, in Taipei said, and so the Taiwan government wants him withdrawn and the Japanese won't do it. But basically there are ties of culture and language. Uh, the president of Taiwan before Chen, uh, before, uh, Chen Shui-bian, uh, Li Deng-wei, uh, spoke better Japanese than Chinese, because he was educated under the Japanese system. Um, so there are those ties. I've always believed that if there were a, cl a military clash, uh, Japan would have to be involved, and Japan would want to be involved, if for no other reason than because the sea lanes from Southeast Asia that bring oil and other products to Japan run right close to Taiwan's east coast. And if Taiwan were to fall into mainland hands, they fear that those sea lanes could be jeopardized. Now, there are many in the US who would argue, well, you just move the ships out a little further. And you can, but it's much more expensive. So Japan has its own reasons, as well as the old ties to Taiwan, to want to stay involved. So you will hear American military and others saying, oh my god, if there's a clash, will the Japanese let us use their bases? I think almost certainly they would. Let's hope there's not a clash. Yeah. Um, in, many of the South, in, in many of the Southeast Asian uh, so-called tigers, mm -hmm. tiger economies, the uh, overseas Chinese Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, in Thailand, and the Philippines seem to be some of the, how do I put it, uh, the money men, the, yes. the very successful. Yeah. Um, how interconnected are the Taiwanese to these other Chinese networks of um, ethnic groups and language and et cetera, et cetera? And are they almost a leader of it as a as people that are recently from the mainland. I just wonder what their position yeah. is. Um, watch for a book in a couple of years by a young woman named Meredith Oyen. Uh, she's my graduate student who recently finished her degree, and she's written specifically on this question of uh, immigration out of um, China and Taiwan and its effect on American foreign policy and implications in Southeast Asia. So that's going to be a very good book. But since that's two years away, I'll tell you what I know about it, which is basically that China and Taiwan uh, early on in the 1950s competed 
over the, for the allegiance of these overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, in the US, and wherever they were. Uh, but it was causing a lot of resentment, uh, particularly with governments in Southeast Asia, who, as you were suggesting, already had reason to be uncomfortable about the overseas Chinese communities because they were the guys with the money. And yeah, especially in Indonesia, and you had massacres and various other kinds of things. Uh, the Chinese government on the mainland, which wanted to be seen as the model for independence movements, realized that trying to claim the allegiance of overseas Chinese was turning these young governments against them. And so they decided that a policy of dual citizenship was not a good idea for China, and so they renounced it. That didn't mean the competition completely ended, but it did de-escalate it in the late part of the 1950s. Uh, also as part of that, uh, the United States wanted the Taiwan government to welcome overseas Chinese to Taiwan, particularly young people to come to the universities so they could get educated in Taiwan and then go home and be pro-nationalist. But Taiwan didn't want them because they thought these were going to be a fifth column, saboteurs, pro-communist, and they were going to come to the island and overthrow the government. So we had a really bad time with Taiwan trying to make them take people that they wouldn't take. Now today, the whole situation is really quite different. Um, those overseas Chinese communities tend to be divided, and you only have to look at the Chinatown here in Washington, what's left of it, uh, and know that there is this mammoth uh, Chinese arch in Chinatown that was donated um, by one side, and the other side wanted to build an arch, a big than that arch, and when it comes to October of every year, you have uh, the October 1st demonstrations and dragons, and then you have the 1010 demonstrations and dragons. So you've got competition that continues, but not with the same heavy political uh, implications as you used to have. Uh, yeah. Thank you. When the 13 colonies received their independence from Great Britain, Great Britain basically said, okay, you're independent now, you know, we're going to take all these things away from you. So let's say Taiwan had no fear of becoming independent for U.S. backing or whatever reason. What do you think China's response would be in terms of creating economic disadvantages and what kinds of structural problems would Taiwan face on its own, so to speak? What do you think about that? That's a great question. Um, it really depends a lot on when this were to happen, but a lot of people would make the argument that this would be economically disastrous for Taiwan. But that assumes that the dependency is all one way, that it's only Taiwan that's dependent on China, not the other way around. And that's not true. Uh, China has become increasingly dependent on Taiwan technology, Taiwan management, uh, a variety of other things from Taiwan. So if the mainland were to start tightening up, for instance, even today, if it were to say to the Taiwan people, you know, all the privileges you get by speaking fluent Chinese and being our brethren we're going to get rid of because you guys are not unifying with us right away, um, they would get hurt themselves. Uh, so it may, there may come a time when that does not matter to the mainland. But I think specialists on the subject would say that the stakes are so high that China would have trouble doing that. Now, I would say, if China gets to the point where it doesn't mind that Taiwan is independent, then there would be no reason for it to try to wage economic warfare. So you kind of assume that those two things would, would go together rather than be uh, uh, working against each other. Uh, how much of uh, the Taiwan issue is an issue for the Communist Party and how much is it an issue for China? Like, 
So if, if we don't have the Communist Party anymore, will Taiwan cease to be an issue? Or? That's a good question. Um, well, I think in some ways it is the fundamental point because the current government in China is arguably not a legitimate government. Um, nobody believes in communism anymore in China, so talking about ideology doesn't help them much. Uh, today, really, the main underpinnings of that government are economic development and economic success. And they've got something there. If, if this year they're going to grow by 8 percent, when Taiwan's going to lose by 3 to 11 percent of minus growth, uh, then they're doing something right. And they essentially stay in power because they've made a bargain with the population which says, as long as we keep you fat and happy, you don't mind that you don't have political rights. Okay? Um, if the Chinese Communist Party can't make that last and they're out of power, then presumably you would get in a new government that would be, one would hope, more democratic. If it were actually a government elected by the people, then I would say it would be a legitimate government because the people have voted, because they've cho So they would not say to the government, how could you let Taiwan go independent? How could you not protect Chinese nationalism? How could you not protect the integrity of the country? Because they would believe in their government for other reasons. This government can't do that. And indeed, nationalism in China it has been on the rise now for some years. And some people would argue, in fact, that any new government is going to be even more nationalistic than the current one because the younger generation in Taiwan is more nationalistic than the older generation is. So it's unclear, but it's not a, it's not a solution. The change of government is not necessarily a solution, but it could be one, depending on what kind of government it is. That, do it. This is sort of similar to what he was asking. I was wondering if there's a difference in perception of Taiwan in different regions and different classes of the Chinese mainland. Um, China specialists used to say, you know, we, we tend to talk a lot about what taxi cab drivers tell us. And um, it used to be the case that I would say to groups like this that uh, the taxi cab drivers don't care about Taiwan. All they care about is how much money they're making and where their kids are going to go to college. Um, and to some extent, I think that's true. But I would say today the nationalism has made a difference. It's not that they care so much about Taiwan per se, but they do care about people who don't want to be part of China. And so you get Tibetans and Uyghurs and Taiwanese and perhaps Mongolians, uh, all of whom ought to be patriotic and they're not, and why is that? Um, I would say you probably, if you looked at it regionally, uh, people in the southeast, in Fujian or Zhejiang, uh, are more interested because it's their uh, families. Often their families divided across that strait. They speak the same dialect. So their ties are stronger. And having Taiwan part of China might suit them uh, particularly well. I would say the people up in the northwest are so preoccupied with suppressing the Uyghurs that they're not, they don't care. They may not even know where Taiwan is. Bit of a follow up. Do you think that if China or if Taiwan were to get their independence, that that might inspire more problems with the Tibetans and the Uyghurs? And Certainly the Chinese would say so, absolutely. Um, but I guess the argument on the other side is I don't think the Uyghurs and the Tibetans need the example of Taiwan. They're set on what they want to do anyway. Uh, and so they're, I mean, what's, it's quite extraordinary if you think about it, what's happened over these last 18 months with these two major minorities um, rising up the way they have. 
and China's inability to deal effectively with that. So I think it doesn't matter whether Taiwan is or isn't part of China, is or is not independent. Um, they have their own goals that they're going to continue pursuing. Yeah. Is kind of opposite, opposite of that true as well, um, as far as whatever happens in those areas not being as big an influence on Taiwan? Um, the, Taiwan has used some of these movements for its own purposes. For instance, it invites the Dalai Lama uh, to Taiwan and makes a big deal out of that, and Taiwan goes berserk. Um, I would say offhand that Taiwan doesn't care a lot about Uyghurs uh, so far. And the, the dirty little secret is that both, uh, that, that Taiwan agrees 100% with China that both those areas are part of China. And indeed, uh, it was only under extreme pressure from the United States that they began to not say that Mongolia uh, was part of China. So in terms of nationalism and what the Chinese map should look like, uh, Taiwan feels the same way. So um, do they use uh, separatist activities in these areas to further their own purposes? Generally not except to the degree that they can make China uncomfortable. But they really don't want to not seem nationalistic in that way. What steps would you like to see the Obama administration take regarding this issue? Um, the people in the Obama administration who deal with Chinese affairs are very good people who I've known for many years and who have had lots of government experience. Um, one of the things that, that makes me happy about what has shaped up is that the man at the National Security Council on China tends to have much more China mainland experience. Um, I wouldn't say he's pro-China, he's pro-American, but he tends to think in terms of China as a great power with which we need cooperation. Um, the man who is Assistant Secretary of State in the State Department for China has much more Taiwan background. It's not that he doesn't know a lot about the mainland. He does. But he was one of the main facilitators of um, a revived military ties, for instance, with Taiwan. He and I together started a program at Georgetown to help train um, Taiwan military uh, in issues of how the U.S. government works and how the world community works and, and other things to try to break down their isolation. So you've got something of a balance there between backgrounds and interests, and I think that's a very good thing. My main concern would be that this issue not get lost amongst the other very pressing things. You know, everything wants the president's attention. This is a particularly difficult beginning of an administration. Um, and there's no doubt that in the end, domestic issues are going to take priority over everything else. But there is a tendency, because of problems like North Korea, like Iran, uh, to say we really need China. Taiwan can't do much for us, and so it tends to get forgotten. I would like that not to happen in this administration. I personally would like, but I do not believe it's going to happen, much higher level um, uh, diplomatic dialogue between the U.S. and Taiwan. Um, when I was in the government most recently as Assistant Deputy Director for National Intelligence, I was not allowed to go, not just to Taiwan, but I couldn't go to Twin Oaks, which is their uh, representative residence here in Washington, because I was too high an official. Unfortunately, they don't realize I'm out of the government and I'm not getting invited now, and the food's good, which is really a shame. <laughs> but um, in any case, I think higher level officials should be talking to each other. Even, I would have said, that before Obama took the oath of office, if not afterwards, that's more complicated. But there was a possibility of Ma Ying Zhou coming uh, to the United States uh, to meet the president. 
Uh, there was a possibility of Ma ying Zhou coming after he was elected, but before he took the oath. All those opportunities were passed over because it was a fear that China uh, would be too upset uh, about that. I think though that's a mistake. Um, I think the fact that George Bush never met with Chen Shui-bian contributed to the drastic downturn in U.S.-Taiwan relations because Bush had no idea what Chun was doing. And Chun didn't understand what kind of man George Bush was. Uh, I think that understanding could have avoided a number of flare-ups between our countries. I think if Obama could talk to the Harvard-trained Ma ying Zhou, uh, there would be a meeting of the minds and perhaps a much more constructive relationship. We heard a perspective on this question I'm about to ask. Um, who in Taiwan is saying, I'm Taiwanese, and who in Taiwan is saying, I'm Chinese, and you know, demographically, what do these people look like, class, just, and what, what factors attribute to these individuals saying, I'm Taiwanese versus I'm Chinese? Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is the enormous change in the balance of that. Um, it used to be that everybody said, or not everybody, I shouldn't say that, but that there was a significant percentage that said they were Chinese. Uh, today, a very tiny percentage says they're Chinese. Almost everybody will say either that they're Taiwanese or, and increasing numbers are saying, uh, we're Chinese and Taiwanese, both. And it's not really a question of class. It is, to some degree, a question of background. The progeny of the mainlanders who came over tend to be those who continue to say, we're Chinese, our roots are in China, we want to be buried on the mainland. But as Warren was saying earlier, the numbers of those are shrinking very much as that generation is dying out. So there's much greater tendency today to think of themselves as both. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier that's so interesting is that before uh, Li Dong Wei, at the end of his administration, and more so Chen Shui-bian came into office, what was taught in the schools was Chinese history, Chinese geography. You didn't learn about Taiwan. Nobody talked about what had happened on the island. The children were not taught the names of the mountains and the rivers in Taiwan, but they knew the mountains and the rivers in China very well. Uh, and it's really that change has been enormous in terms of shaping uh, a, an awareness of being different from the mainland. That million Taiwanese on the mainland also contribute because a lot of them are not having as good an experience as they thought they would have. Uh, it's a bit better today, but there have been all sorts of problems with schools on the mainland and having their children educated the way they want to. And um, uh, just very kinds of frictions with the government and permits to do different kinds of business. And so for many people, uh, the stories that they send back to Taiwan are not all that positive. So there is a sense that we are different and we want to stay different. Um, there, I think the, the, main diff the main challenge to that view is that the younger generation in Taiwan um, doesn't, isn't interested in that issue much one way or another. They want to be left alone to do business with China. Um, do they want to become part of China? No. Uh, but they really are no longer as interested in which they are. Um, they just think that's, that's so 90s. You know? <laughs> yeah, I guess this week we've learned a lot about how um, in the history of China, disunity has been a huge problem. Could you uh, uh, disunity has been a huge problem throughout <coughs> China's history. It's what, uh, what I've learned here, I think. And um, that for Mao, his policies were driven by trying to keep the, the, com the country unified and, you know, had a national, well, a, a movement to, you know, keep the nation together. Um, I just wonder what your feelings are about the nationalism in China in the future. Is it, are there signs now that it's, it's breaking up um, or are there signs that it's going to strengthen in the future? Um, I think nationalism is on the rise uh, everywhere in Asia uh, and other large parts of the world as well. 
Um, but um, I don't see any sign that nationalism is declining. Uh, in fact, the younger generation in China tends to be m more nationalistic and easier to anger over what they perceived as disrespect for China. Uh, so you saw several years ago um, really not government provoked, pretty much independent anti-Japan demonstrations in various parts of China because the Japanese had done things that they felt disrespected China. Um, if you ask the average Chinese college student or university student, they can list all sorts of ways in which the United States uh, does not give China its due. That we discount China, we don't deal with it as an equal, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, this generation, and, and it's not surprising because you know, if you look at the Taiwan issue or a variety of other issues, you then have to go and look at the educational system in China. And the kids that are now in college today have gone through a system that has taught them Taiwan is part of China. Uh, you would, you know, you should die before you let Taiwan go free. Um, and if you've grown up with that, you know, it's not so easy to say, oh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, and I think all uh, around the board on that, these kids have been taught to be nationalistic, to be patriotic, and they take it seriously. And then finally, the other part of it is that China truly today, uh, in Mao's words from 1949, has stood up. It is, if not a superpower, um, a great power. Uh, it's an important country. And so, for instance, today, you don't hear what you heard even five years ago about China being a victim uh, and how the world owes China. Today, China says, I'm not a victim anymore. I have rights, and I want to be part of the international system, and I even want to rewrite the rules of the international system. And so China has played hardball on climate change issues and others because it feels it wasn't there when everybody made those agreements, and now it's being expected to live up to them. And China is saying no. We want to be amongst the people who make the decisions for the world community. I was just wondering, is Bill Clinton still on uh, Taiwan's radar? I mean, just with access to Hillary and things, they look at him as a come on to Taiwan and wine him and dining for the possible connections he has to his uh, that formidable young lady. Well, he's very expensive, you know. When he goes and speaks, he costs a lot of money. Um, the Taiwan, if you uh, decide to read this great classic Taiwan, it's a straight talk, uh, you'll find that Taiwan um, really tried to capitalize on all the times that Governor Clinton came to Taiwan before he was elected president. And he did on four occasions uh, with large groups of um, businessmen from his home state to try to make commercial relations. And I understand he did some other things there, which we won't talk about. Um, but there was, there was a lot of um, feeling that he would care more about Taiwan. In fact, he, he really didn't. Um, my experience with Hillary is that she may well be one of those people who isn't sure where Taiwan is and doesn't care too much. Uh, she thinks that China uh, is the important factor and that when you talk, I mean, one of the reasons you've got this strategic and economic dialogue is because Hillary cares a lot about the economic roots of the relationship. I had the opportunity several years ago of uh, briefing uh, the Democratic senators. They go for a retreat uh, every spring. Uh, and the year I did it, they went to Hershey, so we got lots of chocolate. It was great. Um, but Hillary was there, and uh, I gave a presentation on Cross Straits relations and how important it was. And the only thing she was interested in was jobs uh, and how, what was China going to do to revalue re-evalu its currency so that there would be more jobs for people in New York. Um, and so she's really, I think, one of these great power people, like Condi Rice was, um, that's really not very interested in Taiwan. I may be too critical, uh, but I've seen little evidence that she's very interested. Now, 
counteracting that is Kurt Campbell, who's Assistant Secretary and does care about Taiwan, and presumably will have some influence on her because he's known her for a long time. Is there any interest among, just like, you know, like regular citizens in Taiwan about China's human rights violations, or is really the focus it amongst you know common people on economics and international, you know, situations, or you know, is there concern about that? Yeah, uh, people in Taiwan are very proud of the turnaround in their human rights record. I mean, there was a time when their human rights record was quite bad, uh, not, not the least of which is they used to come and have uh, college students in the United States who talked about independence assassinated. Uh, and so, you know, they, they did some things that, um, do they pay much attention to human rights in China? They do, to some degree. I mean, there are vibrant uh, non-governmental organizations in Taiwan who do take that seriously. And I think Warren said something earlier about uh, how some of these Tiananmen uh, pro-democracy people ended up going to Taiwan and living in Taiwan. Taiwan and Hong Kong both sent supplies to refugees from Tiananmen. So there is a consciousness of that. You're right, they're much more concerned with economic issues. Uh, but they do care about that, and it is on the radar, certainly amongst those people who participate in these kind of non-governmental activities. Okay. Yes? In one of the articles we read, in one of the articles we read for yesterday, you talked about how uh, Kissinger and Nixon, in the end, deceived China and Taiwan. Could you address that a little more? Sure. Um, basically, what I meant by that is that uh, Nixon and Kissinger gave China the impression that they would, without any great pain or strain, be willing to see Taiwan become part of China, essentially disappear, and that they really thought that that was going to be the result of normalization. And uh, certainly to Kissinger, uh, Nixon had some qualms, uh, in part because he knew that there was a constituency in the United States that had voted for him because he was a defender of free China. But Kissinger didn't care at all. Uh, and so they were willing to do that, and they communicated that feeling to the Chinese. And so the Chinese believed that when this process worked itself through, that they would be getting Taiwan, that Taiwan could not survive derecognition. They did not anticipate the Taiwan Relations Act. Nobody did. And so um, I think Nixon and Kissinger really misled the Chinese into believing that that problem had been essentially solved, and that the Chinese were pretty angered when they realized that whatever Nixon and Kissinger had said, that that was not the way the policy was going to go. How did they, what was the deception towards Taiwan? That oh, well, they didn't tell Taiwan what the, Taiwan, there's, there, Taiwan didn't know what was going on. Taiwan knew that there were uh, talks, that there was improving relationship, but they had no idea that normalization was coming when it did. They didn't know Kissinger was going to fly off on that plane. Uh, and um, you know they lied about where Kissinger was. He was up in the mountains because he had stomach flu or something like that in Pakistan. And suddenly, there he was in Beijing. Um, and as I say, I think in that article, um, the, on the American side, those officials who did know um, were so astonished to be carrying out this policy of normalization with China that they forgot all about Taiwan. Taiwan was simply not important to them. Thank you. I was wondering, regarding the Chinese Civil War and the fleeing of the KMT, are there any real accounts of you know, families divided, father against son, brother against brother, anything like that. You mean, can I, I recommend anything it, to read? Right, you know. Uh, it's not a literature that, uh, Barry, do you know that literature at all? 
No. Uh, it's not a literature that I know. I would imagine that there are such things. Whether they're available in English, I don't know. I'm sure they're there in Chinese, um, but I couldn't tell you. But yes, a lot of families were divided. Um, you know, one of the things that Chiang Kai-shek did was he simply marched his troops onto the boats, didn't tell these guys where they were going, and they were leaving wives and children behind. I mean, they managed eventually to drown their sorrows by marrying Taiwan women, uh, and so they got over it. But um, the, um, that's a little cynical, I know. But, um, the, there were definitely families that were divided, and and I think quite a large number um, ended up. One of the things that you have seen in the older generation as they've died out is the desire to go back and be buried in China, um, which has been strong amongst some elements there. Um, but uh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. Um, being that the question, um, friend just asked kind of move towards some kind of literature. Are we there, um, most of us are history teachers. There are some English teachers. The history teachers, we're trying to, at least I'm trying to do more in the um, humanities, read some novels. I was wondering if you could recommend something, any novels maybe on the Chinese Civil War or the Cultural Revolution, it's really not Taiwan, or in Taiwan, anything that might be appropriate for high school seniors or advanced kids even college kids, if you read any novels, I know a lot of us uh, would probably could I'm gonna use some to, names. I was going to say, I'm going to have to think about that. If I can come up with okay. some things, I'll send uh, a list back with Warren tomorrow. Maybe All he right. and I together can. I mean, and it does not just Taiwan, lots right. of right. issues. The, the Cultural yeah. Revolution, I don't know. Yong, yeah. Yong Chang's um, autobiography, the novel that she wrote on, I think it was this Three swans. Wild, 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 swans. wild swans. It's quite a popular it's work, so that. maybe you could recommend that to your, yeah, I mm -hmm. to your students. I, I use that. It's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, most of the, this, that sort of stuff that I've used was when I used to teach Chinese history. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful book that's about uh, Republican China and the, the late imperial China called Daughter of Han. But it's really about traditional China, not about modern China. But Daughter of Han is just a wonderful, wonderful book. All right, thank you. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Maybe if you could see if we can come up with some. Something. Great. I was wondering if there's anything happening in China slash Taiwan like this. You know, a lot of people in the United States and other develop, developed countries go to urban areas to make money and then maybe relocate and maybe not. Are there any mainland Chinese who go to Taiwan to get ahead and then plan on going back to the mainland to live? Not yet, but it's going to start happening. What, one of the things that Ma Yingzhou did was say that uh, mainland businesses can invest in Taiwan, which has been illegal. Uh, because there was a security issue. There was fear that you start getting uh, a fifth, fifth column. You start getting uh, investment, and then the whole economy becomes even more dependent on China. And um, so there hasn't been a way for people to come over and plant roots in Taiwan. Uh, to get to Taiwan for mainlanders has been very difficult. I have a graduate student right now who's doing his dissertation, and he wants very much to go and do research in Taiwan. And he's having trouble getting China to let him go and Taiwan to let him in. Uh, and so that sort of thing continues to be. But I think that's changing. And now you have large numbers of tourists coming uh, every month, uh, every week. Uh, to China. So you're going to increasingly have it. The, the biggest uh, exception to what I'm saying has been um, brides, women, who've been brought back to Taiwan uh, and have married and, and put down roots there. But they've made a commitment to stay, basically. They have nothing to go back to. So I, I don't think it kind of fits in the model that you're drawing. But I would expect in the future that, yes, people will do that. Thank you. As Taiwan is a distinct, you know, entity or tries to be a distinct entity than China, how pervasive 
are the elements of Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and the fabrics of society. If I go to Taiwan, it's going to be markedly different than my experience in China with those philosophy slash religion. Um, well, I can give you a sort of off-the-cuff answer. I don't do domestic Taiwan uh, stuff myself, but um, certainly religion and the practice of religion uh, has been, over time, more consistent and stronger in Taiwan. Uh, but that's less true today, because you've got a very strong underground church movement on the mainland. Um, I, think on, I think there's beginning to be um, more similarities than differences. But over time, Taiwan has been much more committed to all these principles that you were mentioning. Uh, and, it, and it was easy, open, part of the society. You didn't have to sneak around to do it. And you had Christian universities and you know just the, what you get in a, in, a, in a normal free society, which in China you spent all your time fighting for it. Uh, I used to uh, tell people that uh, one of the reasons I got into Chinese studies was that when I started out in college on this, virtually no colleges had China programs, and I spent all my time fighting to get one. I never stopped to think, did, was this what I really wanted to do? Uh, and, I, and I think you get some of that on the mainland. People are uh, practicing these things because they're not allowed to without thinking through how much they believe in it. Um, Mao Zedong wasn't much of a communist until he was in power and under pressure. Uh, so, um, you know, but that's not a great answer, but there's, there's an enormous lot of literature on um, Buddhism, Confucianism, and particularly Christianity uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and so there's a lot out there to read, which no, I can't recommend. <laughs> I have a methodology question. Um, do you find that when you give, um, uh, when you speak now, that you more and more use the PowerPoint? Yeah, you do. So yeah. you pretty much for all your lectures, you have a set of slides that you use. Increasingly mm -hmm. so, um, and this is partly the fallout of being in government. Um, you cannot speak three words in government without PowerPoint. Um, it just it has ta and I, I went in I had never used PowerPoint I went in saying this is ridiculous um, but then it occurred to me you know I was busy carrying these huge maps to class and I would have somebody like Barry carry my map for me and and if he was sick and didn't come I couldn't get my map to class you know and now all you do is have it on there and you can show a picture of John Kai Shek and Mao Zedong it makes things so easy and you can also you know, one of the things I'm sure you have with your students, I certainly had with mine, is at the beginning of class you had to stand there and write all these words on the board because they weren't going to know how to spell these things because they didn't remember from their reading. And now it's all on the slide. And so it's much easier to speak to them and know that they're, they, they're going to get it right in their notes. Uh, so yes, uh, and I do it, increasingly I did it this past year in my um, survey of American foreign policy, um, I started doing it with a U.S.-China class. Um, I, I think I do it a little less with graduate students than with undergraduates. But I think it's wonderful. Yes, M my husband wouldn't dream of it. I offered to even create things for him to show you. And he was, I mean, the fact that you had the map is extraordinary. <laughs> Was he using email yet? Uh, email was a struggle. The biggest struggle actually was an answering machine, which he was really opposed to. Uh, <laughs> I guess I realize now I know nothing about Chinese uh, provincial or local government, and I'm wondering, what, what would Taiwan be like if it became a province of China? How much would that change it? Well, in some ways, the main thing it would change was that uh, the people who occupy 
uh, the presidency and other national security advisor and other jobs like that would be out of work. Now, what the mainland used to say was, you can come and be a deputy prime minister or a deputy state counselor or something like that. Um, those aren't serious positions. And basically, the, the aspiration to be uh, an important official in your own country uh, would be shattered. And to the degree that in Taiwan, like in the U.S., there is a sense that I, too, can rise and become what I want to, um, that it actually is an important uh, element. But I think there is a the, it, uh, sort of a broader cut at that question is that there is a desire for Taiwan to be an actor in the international community, to make its own decisions because its interests are not the same as China. Um, if you have swine flu or SARS in Taiwan, it's going to be a much more serious problem uh, because the population is so much smaller. You know, in Taiwan, uh, this graduate student I mentioned earlier, Meredith Oyen, was in Taiwan doing her dissertation research when the SARS epidemic uh, broke out. And so I was getting constant emails from her. They would take your temperature before you were allowed to get on the subway in Taipei, wow. right? And so the, just the size of the country means that you have very different interests. They're not the same as China. You're going to be ignored. Taiwan would be a small province. Um, if you look at what's happened with Hong Kong, uh, all the promises of one country, two system, um, some of them have been observed. But the Chinese are clearly pushing democracy off into the future more and more. Uh, there's been a lot of self-censorship in Hong Kong. The press is not as free as it used to be, particularly the really good press like the South China Morning Post and others, have they, they self-censor. Um, so it would really change the whole nature of Taiwan society. Uh, and I think people don't want that. And that's really, you know, in addition to the Taiwan identity and simply feeling different, they understand that a lot of the things they're able to do now, they would not be able to do as a province. Yes. Is there any element in the Chinese Communist Party in the mainland who doesn't want Taiwan to come into the country and is advocating against it? Uh, if they, if there is, they say it in the bathroom alone at night when they've turned <laughs> off all the microphones. That is not a position that you can take. No, I, you know, there may be people uh, who would caution against um, taking risks to get Taiwan back. There may be people who would argue you can't, for instance. It, one of the drivers of Chinese military modernization over the last decade or so has been a Taiwan scenario. So China built a missile force, uh, has pushed ahead with its navy and other things, dedicated to the idea of what would it take to attack and invade and capture Taiwan. Today, there are people who argue that's very nice, but we've now exhausted that, and we need to be building a military that is, uh, could deal with the United States, has a blue water navy that can project force more, and we have to think in those terms. Now, is that um, making Taiwan less important to the leadership? I think it's sort of broadening out aspirations, and therefore Taiwan, just by percentages, becomes less important. But nobody would say that out loud, no. And, and one of the things you'll notice is that the, the supreme leader tends always to make Taiwan his personal issue. That was true for Jiang Zemin. It's true today for Hu Jintao. It's going to be true for whoever comes in after him. For balance of power or any other reason, are there any perceived benefits of this issue not being resolved as long as? You mean, does it help China to not resolve it? Or anyone else globally? Well, 
There, as I suggested at the end of uh, my talk, there are those who believe that the United States and Japan, certainly, do not want to see unification as a security matter. Now, it used to be said back in the 50s that Taiwan was an unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, and that the United States needed to keep it for the bases. Uh, today, uh, we don't have bases. And besides, if there were a war, it would go right over Taiwan. Uh, it wouldn't go through Taiwan. Um, but um, I think there are those who believe that because of sea lanes, uh, because of ability to project force, uh, that having Taiwan in Chinese hands could be dangerous, certainly to Japan, but possibly to American interests as well. Um, I think if you talk to people in the government, they will say that that is not a realistic concern. Uh, there are similar discussions about what would happen if Taiwan becomes part of China, what happens to all the advanced military equipment uh, that we sell Taiwan. Uh, but there are people in the government who tell me on a regular basis, we believe that the Taiwan military is so infiltrated now that any secrets that are going to go are going now. And we just take that into consideration when we decide what we're going to sell and not sell. Uh, so uh, are there people? Um, I think there are. Uh, it's, I think it's a little similar to uh, unification of Korea. Are there people who would rather see Korea remain divided? You betcha. In Tokyo, uh, in Beijing, um, and among some Americans. Uh, although I think we're much more in favor of it because we assume the South will dominate and it will be a pro-American. Um, I, I think there's just the feeling that increasingly, if Taiwan were to unify, American business would be shut out. Um, a lot of the advantage we, advantages we have today with Taiwan would evaporate. And so for business interests, um, it, that's not necessarily desirable, although some businesses who are more invested in the mainland uh, might like it uh, because um, it would make travel and communication easier. So there, I think there are people on various sides of it. Um, what everybody agrees on, no war. You know, and, and so things should not get to the point where uh, there would be a military clash to resolve it, and that everybody agrees on. Okay, let's just do one more, and I think I'm fading. Uh, it's all right. No? Anybody? Yeah, I asked okay. I, I have, this is the first public lecture I've done in five months, and I think I'm beginning to run out of steam. But if there's a, any last question? No? Uh, I thank you very much for very good questions.